good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time of the hour when you're watching this and also depending on where you're watching this from. This is the Beholding Christ Show and my name is Ben Fetcher and this is our second episode of uh, our discussion on spiritual warfare. And uh, like I said in our first episode is that spiritual warfare is one of the hottest topics. People discuss about it. People go for overnight prayer meetings, fighting the devil, fighting the air, fighting and fighting and fighting. But uh, there is what we, we discussed in our last episode and we'll take it up from there. But before that, let us pray. Father, we are so delighted this wonderful moment. Thank you for your word. How I pray that revelation flows freely and hindered by anything in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for revelation knowledge. I thank you for my viewers today. As we relax and listen to your word, our lives will be transformed by your word. In Jesus name we pray. Amen and amen. So in our last episode, we talked about spiritual warfare and we established that Paul talks about warfare, talks about fighting, talks about overcoming, not in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, but he talks about uh, warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, not even from verse 1, he talks about it from verse number 10. And I remember in our last episode, we divided the book of Ephesians into three. The first part is Ephesians chapter 1, from uh, Ephesians chapter 1 up to chapter number 3. The second part is Ephesians chapter 4 up to chapter number 6, verse 9. The third part is Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 10 to verse 24. So in the first part of the book of Ephesians, as Paul is addressing the church at Ephesus, he is establishing believers. And not just the believers at Ephesus, but even our today's believers, that is you and I. He is establishing us in the realities of our identity in Christ. Then in the second part, he is uh, urging the believers to walk worthy of their identity in Christ. Then the, that part, he is urging believers now and instructing believers on how to stand in their identity even when the, uh, the enemy attacks. Praise be to God. So the first part, which is chapter 1 up to chapter number 3, uh, Paul talks about our resting position, our sitting position. In If you can go to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, he says, Chapter 2, verse 6, I can read it uh, using the, uh, the New King James Bible version. He says, maybe I can start from verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Look at what Paul is saying. He, say, uh, he says that God is rich in mercy. Hey, maybe I can take it up from verse 1. He says, And you he made alive, who are dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So he is establishing us and showing us who we are. He shows us who we were. We were dead in trespasses and, and sins. And we walked according to the course of this world. And we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. And he says, or he calls that prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. That is who we were before Christ. We were sons of disobedience, among whom also we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So he talks about a certain nature that we had before Christ. We were children of wrath, just as others. Then in verse 4, he, he starts with a but. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy. Again, remember in our first episode, we said forgiveness or the redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins, is not according to our confession. God does not wait for us to confess the sins that we have, we have uh, committed, uh, you know, what people call omission and commission, what I did knowingly and unknowingly. So they think when I tell God about what I did knowingly and knowingly, commission and omission, then God will forgive me. But we saw that redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins, is according, it is in his blood and according to the riches of his grace. And I remember as, our, as we were winding up in our last episode, we said that the day you'll be able to measure up the grace or the riches of his grace, that is how uh, how vast, how well you are forgiven. Now in verse 4, he tells us, but God, who is rich in mercy. 
Hallelujah. So despite us being children of wrath, despite us being sons of disobedience, despite us being dead and in trespasses and sins, God is rich in mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. For example, you deserve to be punished for your sins, but you don't receive it when mercy shows up. There is a song that says that when sin demanded justice, mercy said no. Hallelujah. So, who, uh, but God was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Praise God. It is in his great love that he loves us. And he puts it in the past with which he loved us. So he didn't, he didn't wait for us to be lovable. He didn't wait for us to qualify for his love. He loved us anyway. Hallelujah. Even when we were dead in, uh, in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. So this is who we were. We were dead in trespasses. But because of his great love with which he loved us, we who are dead in trespasses, he has made us alive. Praise God. So we had received a nature, and by nature we were children of wrath because of the sin we had inherited from Adam. We were children of wrath. But when Christ died, he died and he came to make us, a, even when we were dead in trespasses, he has made us alive with Christ. Praise be to God. And he says, by grace, you have been saved. So we have been made alive. So even before we go into any warfare, before we start arguing with the devil, blah, 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 and all that, we must be established in these realities. And he says in verse 6 that, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This was our key verse for today. That he has made us, he has raised us up together and he has made us to sit together in the heavenly places. I know someone is still wondering, are you still talking about warfare? Yes, I'm talking about warfare. But you cannot go to the battlefield before you are taught and established and know who you are. Otherwise, you'll miss it because you'll be fighting the wrong enemy. So he says, we have been raised together with Christ. We have been made to sit. So Ephesians chapter 1 up to chapter 3 talks about our sitting position in Christ. He talks about how we've been brought near to God, how we've been uh, been made one with God. He talks about how we've been, uh, we have been made one in Christ and all that and how we've been created in Christ Jesus and all that, that is our sitting position in Christ. The main verse is Ephesians 2 verse 6. We has raised us up together. And he has made us to sit together with Christ. Where? In the heavenly places. So before we go into the battlefield, we must be established in where we are seated. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. I know many believers think like uh, in the future, and by and by, when, when, uh, when the trumpet will blow, we'll go to heaven. But that is not what the scripture says. The scripture does not promise us a heaven in the future. The, 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 the issue of heaven is not a promise for the future to the believers. It is a present day reality. He says, I read again, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. He says what? He has raised us up together and made us sit together. Where? In the heavenly places. So every believer, before you engage in any warfare, you must understand that you are seated where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So if there is any enemy who is coming to attack you, if there is any devil that wants to attack you, if there is any curse, you know, we've been taught about generational curses, been taught about um, uh, witchcraft and all that. If there is any of them that has to attack you, believer, you must first be established in the understanding that you are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Where? In Christ Jesus. So where are the heavenly places? In Christ Jesus. Where are you? You are in Christ. So you and Christ is in you. So you are in Christ in heaven and heaven is in you. Okay, I'm not talking about your body and your, your soul. I'm talking about your spirit. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So anything that has the power and audacity to attack you, it can only attack you, uh, it can only attack Christ, then it reaches to you. And I take it even, uh, uh, make it even more serious. The Bible says that we are hidden with Christ in God. So this is a double wrap. If there is a curse that can, can get to where a believer is, your position matters. You are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So any curse that comes to you must first come to God, 
then to Christ, then to you. Hallelujah. So if God cannot be cast, you cannot be cast. If Christ cannot be cast, you cannot be cast. Why? Because you are in Christ Jesus. But someone will tell me that there are some curses that have been operate, uh, operating in our family. And uh, we have generational patterns. Like people say in our family, people don't even uh, go beyond from four. You know, people don't go beyond a certain level of life. People cannot even, there is none in our family who has bought a car. Nothing like uh, prosperity in our family. Poverty is a generational curse in our family. In our family, we suffer from asthma. We suffer from cancer. We suffer from all manner of diseases. Those things that people call generational curses or generational patterns. But you see, it matters where you are. So are you still seated or are you still walking in your family? The Bible says the moment you believe in Christ, you are transferred. That is what Colossians 1 verse 12 says, that you have, trans, you have been transferred. And where are you now? Your place is in Christ. So your position matters. Your sitting position matters. So that is to say, even before you engage in generational curses of warfare, you must be established in this, that you are in Christ. You are hidden with Christ where? In God. So there is no generational curse for every believer. If you are a believer in Christ, if you are a believer in Christ, Generational curses cannot come near you. Praise be to God. But now, uh, you must understand what Christ has done for you. Because we have seen people who are born again, and these patterns are still following them. Why? Because they have, uh, you know, the Bible says in Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, that my people perish for the lack of knowledge. So when you know in your knower, when you know inside you who you are and the position you are in, no matter what comes your way, no matter who tries to negate the realities that you have in Christ, you stand and you cannot be moved. That is why Paul had to use this order. He could not uh, take them into the battlefield before establishing them in who they are. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, so in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 up to chapter 3, he's talking about our sitting position in Christ. Our sitting position in Christ. And this deals with our relationship with God. You know, the greatest worry of believers or the greatest, the greatest worry of every human being in this world is whether they are in good terms with God. And as a result of, uh, as a result of that, many people try, are trying every day, maybe praying hard, uh, going to church, giving their tithes, giving their offerings. They try all manner of things that they think they can do or they can try to be in good books with God. But let me tell you, the good news is this. There is nothing within the ability of man. There is nothing that man can do to make himself to be in good books with God. Everything that you require to be in good books with God is what Christ did for you. And this is what Paul is telling you in Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Praise be to God. So you are in good books with God. God is not mad at you. I know I say this a million and one times, that God is not mad at you, but he is madly in love with you. God is not angry with you. You know, there are people who think like God is angry with me. No, God is not angry with you. Even for you, that don't, you have not yet believed in the gospel. Maybe you've not even received Christ in your life. Still, God is not angry with you. Actually, your forgiveness was given more than 2,000 years ago. I say that today, God is not forgiving anyone. Today, God is not redeeming anyone. Redemption, which is the forgiveness of sins, happened more than 2,000 years ago. But it's not everyone who has received that forgiveness. So when we preach the gospel, we preach that you may believe what was done more than 2,000 years ago and receive it and enjoy it. Hallelujah. That is the sitting position in Christ. So our relationship with God has been sorted. So do you have to worry about the second coming of Christ? No, it is not your relationship with other people that will qualify you for the second coming of Christ or to be taken into heaven. No, it's, the, it's, the, it's your relationship with God and your relationship with God has been established. Praise God. So you should not worry about the second coming of Christ. Why? Because you are established in his first coming. The first coming of Christ, which he did more than 2,000 years ago, 
established you and established your salvation. And today, you should be assured of the gift of salvation. Hallelujah. That is to say, you should not worry whether you'll be judged or not. Why? Because the Bible says we have passed from death to life. We have passed from judgment. And actually, he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, that even in the day of judgment, we will have boldness. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. So that is our sitting position. Ephesians chapter 1 to chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 4 to chapter 6, verse 9. Now Paul tells the believers, having known that you have been, you have been, uh, you have been brought into good works with God. You have been forgiven. You have been accepted in the beloved. You have been made worthy to stand in the presence of God. You have been accepted by God. Now he says, walk worthy of who you are. Hallelujah. It's like when, uh, when you are hired in a certain company. When you're hired in a certain company, maybe you are hired as a civil servant or you're hired as a, as a casual laborer. Let me give that example. You're hired in a certain manufacturing company as a casual laborer. Then after some two years or after some one year, you are promoted into a supervisor or let me say you're promoted into a manager. The first week, there is something that happens to you. You are given something we call orientation. What is the purpose of orientation? The purpose of orientation is to show you not who you should become, but who you have become. You are already a manager. Now this is how you should walk. This is how you should behave. That is how you, this is how you should relate with the casual laborers. This is how your salary will be. You know, you are educated to realize you are introduced to the new you. Before you are a casual laborer, you are working like just a casual laborer, but now you have been promoted, you are a manager. The first uh, maybe one week or two weeks, you are you are about something we call orientation. And during orientation, you are introduced into the new you. Now you are a manager. This is how you should behave. This is how you should make your course. This is your new office. These are your responsibilities and all that. Praise God. So after now you believe in Christ, you became a new creation. You became one with God. You are established. Your sins were forgiven. We are not discussing your sins again. Now you have been brought into a new position in Christ. Hallelujah. So the second thing that is expected of you is to walk worthy. So after you are given the orientation of who you, who you have become, now you, after the two weeks of orientation, you are told, now walk worthy. Be the manager you are. Be the president you are. Be the supervisor you are. Praise be to God. So that is how it goes after you are established in who you are. So the first part, Ephesians chapter 1 to chapter 3, establishes you in who you are. The second part now is to tell you, walk worthy of who you are. So you see, in understanding this, you will not struggle because you are walking worthy. It's not the, it is not in your walking worthy that you qualify to be a son of God. It is because you are a son of God that you are being told to walk worthy as a son of God. Praise be to God. This is how sons of God walk. This is how sons of God talk. This is how sons of God behave. Praise be to God. So in the second part, which is uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 up to chapter number 6 verse 9, it's called the walking worthy position. Hallelujah. Now you walk worthy of who you are. It's not a commandment. It's not a law. It's just an exhortation to tell you now that this is who you are, walk like it. Amen. So the first position, sitting position. The second one, walking position. The first one, our relationship with God. The second one, our relationship with one another. It is there you, you see Paul talking about husbands love your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. Is where you see Paul talking about children obey your parents. That is where you see Paul talking about masters. Uh, deal, do not deal harshly with your servants. Servants respect your masters. These are not laws. These are not commandments. These are just exhortations because of who you've been made to be. And now in our third part, where this is our, where our emphasis is about spiritual warfare. Now we are told that. Stand. Now we can go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse uh, 
uh, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. After you know who you are, after your relationship with God is sorted out, your relationship with others is sorted out, now, because we are not ignorant of the schemes of the devil, we are not ignorant of the presence of the enemy, now how do you deal with him? And he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We say it, we have a, a strength that comes from our union with Christ. And I say that, uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So number one, we are not fighting the devil, we are fighting the wiles, the schemes, the trickeries of the devil. Wherefore, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age. Therefore, take up your the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and, and having done all, to stand. So that that part is now our standing position. So that is to tell you when the enemy lies to you, when the enemy tells you that your sins are not forgiven, when the enemy tells you that God is angry with you, the warfare is in this. You know who you are, so you stand in your position. And that is how you overcome the lies of the devil. The language of the devil is lies. Since the beginning, in the, book, in the Garden of Aden, he lied. He lied to the children, uh, he lied to Adam and Eve, and they gave in to his lies, and that is how he became the God of this world. So his language is to lie. His language is to lie. He comes and tells you you are not healed. You know, warfare is not like pulling things that are all there in the air. You know what people say. Like I've heard people in in our in our beloved nation, Kenya pulling down the strongholds of Persia, the prince of Persia. And you wonder whether Kenya is in, whether Persia is in Kenya or Kenya is in Persia. You don't know. People are confused when it, when it comes to warfare. And they are pulling down things that they don't even know what they are. But you must realize that the battlefield is not anywhere else. The battlefield is in the mind. Praise God. It is in the mind where the devil communicates to you and tells you how unworthy you are. But you stand your position and remind him that in the first part of Ephesians, you have been established that you are accepted in the beloved, that you are okay with God, that you are loved by God. Hallelujah. So we are not ignorant of the devil. And he says, therefore, take up the whole armor. In our next episode, I know we'll be talking about the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So there is a day called the evil day, but he didn't say that you take the armor and fight the devil. He, he says that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. I don't know what you've been fighting in your life. Maybe you're fighting a battle that is not there. The greatest battle of human beings, the greatest battle of a man is not in the air. It is in the mind. Praise God. And uh, I want to read a verse in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 3. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down what? Strongholds. So in this warfare, what are strongholds? What are strongholds? You know, people uh, define strongholds in different ways. They say that strongholds are things in the air, uh, like uh, there are battles we've got to fight with the devil in the air. But let me shock you. You don't have to fight the devil. You don't have the ability to fight the devil. Yeah, you don't want, you don't have, you are not supposed to fight the devil. You know why? Colossians 2 says, 2.15 says that having disarmed principalities, who? Christ, he has disarmed powers and principalities. Praise be to God. The devil has been disarmed. He is powerless. That idiot has nothing to fight you with. He has been disarmed. Praise God. He is defeated. You know, Jesus said that he came that he may destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. The devil was defeated, not by you. You are not the ones meant to fight the devil. It was Christ who was meant to fight the devil. So the devil has been defeated. So your work is not to fight the devil, but to stand against his trickeries. So the strongholds that we are talking about here are not the devils in the air. No. Listen, he says, casting down, 
So pulling down strongholds. So these strongholds also means to cast down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is what we call warfare. To cast down, to pull down those arguments. And where are those arguments? Those arguments are in the minds of men. To cast them down because they exalt themselves themselves against the knowledge of God. So, and when we cast them down, uh, we, we cast them down, those arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We bring every thought, we bring what? Every thought into the, cap, uh, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So warfare is not fighting things that are there in the air. Warfare is pulling down strongholds in your mind, casting down arguments, like now God tells you you are righteous, but I can see those arguments in your mind telling you, but you don't act righteous. That is warfare. That is what Paul calls the good fight of faith. God calls you righteous, but there are arguments in your mind telling you, you don't act like a righteous man. So you are not, uh, you are not actually righteous. Now you must stand in your position and declare to the enemy that because of what Christ did, I have been made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. God says you are healed, but there are arguments in your mind telling you, you know what? You still have the, the symptoms of the same sickness. You still have pain in your body. You're not healed. Those are arguments and imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So we must cast them down. Hallelujah. And that is what we call spiritual warfare. Praise be to God. And uh, because of time, uh, we'll stop it at that point for today, but we'll take it up from there where we're talking about the battlefield is in the mind. And we'll get into depth and we'll understand what that means in our next episode. So this has been uh, uh, Beholding Christ, the Beholding Christ show. And my name is Ben Fetcher. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the ministry of your word. How we are delighted that we are established in you. And my Lord, we are seated with you in the heavenly places. And we walk worthy of who we are. And we stand in our position because we have been made uh, to rest in Christ Jesus. I thank you for my viewers. Every thought that is contrary to the word of God, I arise again it and I pull it down. I therefore declare that you are healing right now. Them that are feeling unwell in their bodies, I speak wholeness right now into their bodies in the name of Jesus Christ. Those who are confused or in a dilemma to make a certain decision, I declare the divine wisdom of God in their lives in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray and we believe. Amen and amen. So three parts of Ephesians, you are sitting position in Christ, your deal, your relationship with God is okay. You are walking position in, in Christ, your walk with each other is sorted out when you are established in who you are in Christ. And thirdly, how you stand against the enemy. That one is also sorted out when you are established in your sitting position in, your, in Christ. So thank you for tuning in. This has been the Beholding Christ show only on Wema TV. And thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you in our next episode. You are blessed. Amen.